Um, this talk was, suppo was supposed to be a workshop, then it was supposed to be a talk, then it was supposed to be a workshop, and it ended up being a talk. So at the end, I'm going to try to run uh, over a quick demo on synthetic data, and I'm going to give you a few tools and a few t uh, tips and tricks to get started with it. But the whole of the talk is going to be um, about what is synthetic data, uh, how can we think of it, and then I have a few fun examples that hopefully at least make you laugh. Uh, if you want to access the slides, uh, there's the QR code there, and then you can have them. Um, and yeah, so let's get started. Um, so a bit about the agenda, I'm going to let me introduce myself as well because I haven't uh, told you anything about me. Uh, we're going to talk about fake data, we're going to talk about synthetic data, we're going to talk about machine learning generated data, we're going to go through the demo, and then I'm going to have a final thought for you. Um, so if you thought that all those three were the same, then you're probably correct. If you thought that all three of those were different, you're also correct. Um, so, so let me introduce myself. My name is Ramon. Um, I am originally from the Dominican Republic. I came to the U.S., studied here, lived here 10 years, moved to Australia. Um, here in the U.S., I worked as a researcher, first in Kansas City, at a company that does consumer behavior, and then at a small think tank in Washington, D.C. Then I moved to Australia, I became an educator, and I was also doing research at a university in, with a university in Singapore at the intersection of machine learning and management sciences. I've done a lot of, um, I've worked on a, I've been fortunate enough to work on a lot of amazing projects from um, NLP to different use cases in um, tabular, using tabular data um, to also different use cases using deep learning. And now I work as a developer advocate at Seldom. At Seldom, we are a machine learning infrastructure company focusing on the last end of the machine learning life cycle. When you think about, you train your model, you have evaluated it, you already have a, some artifact that you want to deploy and you're ready to put it somewhere. Uh, we are that company. We build those tools that help you go and achieve the last mile of it. Not only do we let you serve it, but we also help you uh, evaluate um, the outputs that your, model or, uh, that your model gives you and also to monitor the inputs that go into your, uh, into your model. So that's a little bit about me, what I'm doing right now. I'm based in London. Um, um, I miss the U.S. a little bit. Uh, Australia, Australia was quite fun too. I moved there right before uh, what they call there the bushfires. Here we call it wild, wildfires. And so I had a very warm welcome to Australia. And, but anyway, so that's a little bit about me. Let's talk about um, the, the meat of the session, the, the, the main thing of the session. So uh, all the data, synthetic data, what, what do we mean by that when we say synthetic data? Well, if you think about real data, or and you might you might think of data that we can not technically see because the actual definition of data, or not the actual definition, but the way in which we think of data is things that are intangible. When you think of these numbers you, and you write them in a piece of paper, yeah, you can touch the piece of paper, but you cannot touch that number or that, or that piece of information that represents something in the real world. So um, real data, let's put it into one bubble, and then what could exist, let's put it into another bubble. And that's what we're going to call, uh, it doesn't need to be real, but it could be real data. So what are we talking about? So when we see something, uh, when we don't see something, or the things that we can imagine that are real, the things that are not, let's think about the space of possibilities. And that's where we're going to live today. And we're going to talk about putting synthetic data into that domain. That could be real, but it doesn't have to be. And we can see it, or we could use it. So first, there is synthetic data, something that could come from uh, the real world. And then next is machine learning uh, generated data. It could come from the real world, but it could be very well something that has never existed before. I'm sure some of you that have already been seeing and hearing and probably even been sick of the hype of uh, LLMs and all this stuff um, in all the social media, um, you probably heard of the word hallucination. And you probably heard of the words, uh, oh, it's making shit up. Um, so that's the domain where we're really like, okay, where did that come from? Um, maybe it came from something real, maybe it didn't. Because um, right now, there's, uh, 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 there have been recent uh, papers and studies on uh, how machine learning models can degrade if they are trained on synthetic data that was generated by the same machine learning methods. Um, so then the last one is fake data. Uh, I put it into a small bubble here, but honestly, it could be it could be quite wide. It could be it could even be wider than the other two that, that you see over there. So take that as a very um, wide point of view, my point of view. 
Um, so those are kind of like that's kind of the spectrum that I want you to imagine uh, for the for the rest of the talk. And then so so what is fake data? Can anybody here tell me what do you think fake data is? Anybody? Yep. Uh, data that doesn't necessarily come from like a, a source, like it's not generated from actual observation or right. other sorts of data collection methods. Right. That's correct. It's, it's random. It, sorry. Fake numbers. Fake numbers. Exactly. It's, it's fake numbers. It's something that doesn't exist. Could it look real? It could look real, it could look real, right. So now we have the right definition of fake data. So um, it is um, you know, stuff that is fake, stuff that is completely bogus, it doesn't need to exist. It could look real, um, but it doesn't, it, it, it could sound like a good story, but it might very well be a made up story. Um, but seriously, it's, it's fake. It's um, completely random, nonsense stuff. Um, so here is a good example. Uh, this person is completely fake and made up. Made up. Mike Lovick, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this movie and you probably know uh, what, what we're talking about. Another example would be the famous Lorem Ipsum, Ipsum, whatever that you put as a placeholder inside of uh, inside websites where you're building something. So when your front end team um, has an idea of the business logic of what your application is going to look like, what it should be doing, but they don't necessarily have the content or the copyright. They want to put a placeholder to see how things look. Then they turn to fake data or uh, synthetic, or not synthetic data, but fake data. Data that things that you can just put somewhere. So we're on the right track now. So what about um, how do we make it? Uh, how do we make synthetic data? Well, there's different ways right now in Python. And um, so to, I think my favorite library that, and the one that we're going to walk through uh, today is called My Mises. Um, I also thought it was Mimesis, but it's not. It's My Mises, and it comes from a Greek god, I believe. Um, it's a really nice tool that allows you to access randomly generated data from different locales. If you are trying to put data from into a website that you're building and it's fake, just as a placeholder, and you are from a specific part of the world that speaks a specific language. Maybe you don't want to use English. Maybe you want to use another one. And that's what it means when I refer. That's what I mean when I refer to the word local. Um, then there's Faker, one of the most famous ones and one of the most widely used ones. Um, you can generate synthetic uh, fake data with NumPy. You can generate it with Scikit-Learn. There's another one, PyDBGen, um, that I've seen. It hasn't been active for about three years, so I don't know. I, I think it still works, uh, but I haven't really tried it. It seems like. Um, it picked up a lot of momentum because it allows you to create pandas data frames. Uh, and there's another one called Synth, um, and it's a command line uh, tool built on ROS. It's actually quite nice, but in the, way, in the way in which you define your the synthetic data that you want and the distribution that it's going to come from, uh, or how you want your random numbers to be generated, uh, comes from a JSON file. So it's quite nice. Uh, then why is this important? Well, um, you can test systems without exposing real data. If you're going to put a placeholder there and you're going to break a whole system or wrap up a really big bill, um, then you might as well put some synthetic data there as opposed to data that comes from your users. If you are testing, say, V2 of your website, or um, even if you're testing a machine learning model, create some, something, just see if the requests are coming in, are going in uh, correctly, if the request, if the output is coming in uh, fine, back to you. Um, so then you can speed up development because you don't have to go and access things that maybe you don't have uh, the right credentials for. Uh, you can uh, do training and education. There's a, I'm sure a lot of you have probably come across tutorials that use fake data of some sort, or some of you, uh, when you have gone to the scikit-learn docs, the first thing that you notice at the very beginning is make blobs or make uh, regression uh, data and so on. So that sort of helps for educational purposes. Um, scenario simulations. Uh, no labeling needed, so you don't have to worry about, oh, am I going to have the right label over here or not, because you are doing something that is going to take you faster to where you want to go. Um, it's not the end goal. So that's uh, fake data. So what about synthetic data? Um, can anybody tell me, what do you think synthetic data is, now that we just described fake data? Is it generated from like a baseline? That's very good. It is generated from a baseline. It is generated from somewhere. It didn't just come from thin air. It looks like real. It could be real. So um, right now, for example, if I was in the sample um, in some database that where that it was taken as the baseline to create some synthetic data, then in the new database you could put Ramon and then you could put Smith. 
or something like that. So Latino and white doesn't really go uh, very well, but it could, you know. So the name, but it could be real, but it doesn't necessarily have to be real. But let's make that more concrete. Um, so what is it? It's a mirror. It's, a, it's kind of like you can think of it. In a, to give you an analogy, you can think about it as a mirroring the uh, the real data. Um, so, but let's define it. So, synthetic data refers to artificially generated data that mimics the statistical properties and patterns of real-world data without containing actual obser observations. Um, so, that's another way to, de to define it. So, it mimics uh, the real-world data because it gets drawn from the distribution that generated that. When we think of data, when we think of things that we use to do statistical analysis or to do data analysis on, um, we usually assume that there was a distribution at some point in time, in, in some shape or form, that created that data. The fact that you are here today and say, for example, at the end of today, you fill out a survey, there's, a, there's some sort of distribution that you randomly ended up here today and you ended up filling out that survey. So something created that data, some sort of distribution that we don't know and we want to approximate it in some way. So how do we make it? Uh, well, you first define the problem that you, that you have. Say, for example, um, you work at a healthcare company. You want to create some uh, models, but you're not the most, the, the best expert in machine learning, say. And you don't know if at some point in time your model might leak information about the people that the data, the people inside the data that it was used to be trained with. So define the problem. The first thing that you want to uh, do, you want to create a new drug or do something, you're going to have to use data that has personally identifiable information. The second one, understand the data that you have. Like, what can I use? What should I not use? Do I, do I need to use it? Do I need to have it there? Do I need to create synthetic data from this particular sample? If the answer is no, don't add it. Um, choose a suitable model. There's plenty of models to choose from. Um, and this is something that blew my mind when I first started looking at um, synthetic data generation techniques. Uh, there's a lot of models to choose from and you can, there's, if you don't have a baseline, uh, you can go with like, uh, there's models that are easier to get started than others. So pick a model, uh, make sure you educate yourself in what the outcome will be from one to the other. Um, train and evaluate, generate the synthetic data, validate the new data, refine and iterate and, iterate and improve, uh, and then document and, and report it. So those are things that you probably come across if you have done a full data science project, for example, or a full machine learning project. Okay, so what tools can we use? Um, so there's quite a few, but um, something that I want to point out in this one is that about um, two or three of these are actually open source, but not really open source. They're, not, they're uh, business source licenses. So Synthetic Data Vault is probably one of the nicest ones right now to generate synthetic data, but um, it's not fully open source. But I think if I understood cor correctly the law jargon in the license, um, and, that was, and, and that was an easy, it was, they don't want you to use their tool to generate synthetic data and, and sell it as a product. You can use it for things that are going to improve your product, but you cannot use it for, uh, for something that will compete with them using their own product. Fair enough. Um, there's 25, I haven't used it, but it seemed quite nice. Um, SD metrics is for metrics to calculate different things from your the synthetic data that you generated. Gretel Synthetics is also business source licensed. Um, I don't find, um, I think it's a good tool. Um, you should check it out. I, I, I don't think all of the tutorials are super up to date, but I think you can still follow along quite well. Um, synth uh, then Synthetic Data, uh, that one is by White Data. That one is quite nice as well, and then they also have a profiling tool. That's why you see the two boxes that are quite similar. And then, so why does this matter? Why does synthetic data matter? Well, you can increase privacy. Um, you can do cost-efficient analysis. So if you think about uh, experiments, so um, the other day, I was doing this talk as a workshop at ODSE West uh, this past Monday, and one of the uh, attendees in my talk, she works at a pharmaceutical company, um, at a drug, development company. And one of the things that they're trying to do with synthetic data is to generate data for patients and try to see if they, they can generate similar enough data so that the FDA could come close to approving a drug that wasn't uh, particularly developed on real people uh, per se, but it was, it was developed using real or synthetic data. 
And that's quite interesting because if you think about it, there's a lot of um, um, there's a lot of experiments that are happening right now, or that continue to happen, where you need human samples, human uh, you need humans to be able to test those experiments. Is it possible that we could create um, synthetic data to get the results of generating new drugs that will help cure some diseases without having to put people through some uh, hardships? Because some all those some of those experiments can go uh, quite um, uh, quite badly. I remember when I was at uni, uh, I got a call from uh, from a pharmaceutical. Uh, or from a lab in Missouri, and they say, "Hey, would you love to um, would you love to do an experiment with us and come in and stay at our lab for a few days? Uh, we're going to pay you about five thousand dollars, five thousand dollars." And you know, as a broke student, you're like, five thousand dollars? Go on. Um, what are you talking about? And then they said, "Well, look, we have to this as a disclaimer. We have to tell you what could go wrong." And I said, "Go on. Um, it's five thousand dollars." And they said, "Well, there's a ten percent chance that you could go blind." because we're going to put something in your eyes, but don't worry, 90% it will be fine. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you very much, uh, but no thank you. Uh, this was about 11 years ago now, and um, it is, I still remember, uh, remember, like, there has to be people that go through that for uh, these drugs to be developed. And I can only feel for those who have landed on the 10% that has gone wrong. Uh, data augmentation. Uh, one of the coolest examples uh, with synthetic data is, uh, in, is, in particular, in the um, auto uh, in the auto industry, where you think of autonomous driving vehicles. You are not always going to have all of the edge cases that your cameras or your radars could detect. But if you have synthetic data being generated with um, that in mind, the the fact that you want to create cases that your car and that your cameras have never captured, but you know could happen. Wouldn't that save you a lot of money and also a lot of time? It could make your car safer, uh, augmenting the data with things that could be real, that could happen in the road. Uh, then better edge case detection, which that ties up uh, with what I just mentioned. Uh, increased customization. You could also create things that just haven't happened. Similar, in the same way, things that haven't happened but could happen. Uh, faster, spru uh, faster approval concept, in the same way, of, uh, the same thing that I mentioned about uh, experimentation for drug companies. And then less labeling um, as well. Okay, so machine learning generated data. Um, so what is it? Deep learning model architectures that learn uh, to produce novel data after being shown countless of examples. And you're like, I see. Okay, go on. Uh, what are you talking about? So how do we get started? So there's about there's about four architectures that are widely used today. Um, one is generative adversarial networks. The other one is variational auto encoder uh, auto encoders. Um, diffusion models and flow-based models. Let's describe all of those and, let's and then let's give you an example so that you can have an idea of what they are. So generated adversarial networks, um, these are a class of machine learning algorithms that consist of two networks. One is called uh, the generator and the other one is the, um, the discriminator. You pitch these two against each other and one is trying to fool you into, hey, this is, this is fake, this is not fake, and the other one is kind of like a detective. It's trying to detect, uh, it's trying to call your bullshit out. Uh, essentially, and so that's really what it is. And then, um, and actually, I removed that image from the previous one, but we're going to see it here in a second. Um, okay, so the other one is variational autoencoders. Um, these are architectures that have two things: uh, an encoder um, architecture and a decoder architecture. And they're kind of similar to what um, ChatGPT is to uh, the GPT models are doing, like GPT-3, GPT-4, and so on. Um, the main difference is that I believe GPT-3 and uh, 3.5, they are decoder-only architectures, and then other models like T5, uh, that's the actual name of it, uh, is, has both, a decoder and an encoder. Models like BERT, they have an, enco uh, an encoder only, and the difference between those two is the decoder is better at generating, or one of the differences is that the decoder is better at generating, it can do a lot of stuff that the encoder can, and then the encoder is better at grabbing some context, uh, grabbing the sample, and then doing a task. So for example, BERT might be um, faster and easier to use for sentiment classification and other particular kind of tasks that are not necessarily text generation. Okay, so then variational autoencoders. Uh, what are these ones? So these are probabilistic generative models in machine learning that enable efficient learning uh, and generation of complex data by encoding input data into a lower dimensional space and decoding it back to generate diverse samples. Okay, so give the 3.5, Claude, Lama 2 are class, uh, or are similar to VAs. They're not exactly VAs. Transformers and VAs um, are different, but they have a similar architecture where they have the encoder and the decoder. 
Um, then we have diffusion models. Diffusion models are like unraveling, I put a little analogy here, they're like unraveling a suspenseful story. At first you see everything clearly, but then the plot fades. Um, and then a veil of mystery, noise, uh, noise descends, and then with a chapter, and with each chapter there's a timestamp. You keep, in one part of the model you're adding noise, say, to an image, and then another part of the model is trying to denoise it. So you add, say, black dots or pixels into an image, and then you try to decipher what was the pixel that will make of this one in the best way possible. Um, so stable diffusion is the, one of the most prominent examples of this one, but there are also other incredible ones like audio LDM, and I have an example of that one, and refusion. Uh, and then the last one is flow-based models. These are also very cool models, um, but I feel like they're not, they don't have as much, uh, they don't have as much attention as um, transformers and uh, diffusion models. So flow-based models, they're generative models in machine learning that learn a bijective mapping between a simple distribution Gaussian and the target distribution, allowing for efficient generation of high quality samples by tra transforming random noise through the learned mapping. Uh, and then some examples is real MVP, and I have an example here so that if you have never heard of that model, um, you can see it here in a second. So one example is um, this picture. This, per this person actually doesn't exist, and this was generated by, a, uh, by an adversarial network, by a guy. And then if I go up and then I come down, you're gonna see another one. And then if I go up and down, you're also going to see another person there. Um, none of these people exist, but it's pretty impressive to think that if we didn't know better, we would say like, oh yeah, I just saw this person this morning. Um, then diffusion example. So um, this is one of my favorite models uh, that I've seen. It's called um, Audio LDM. Let me see if I can actually play this one here. I might not be able to. So this is when it was first created, and this is, I believe, at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the video, you see um, the very first model out of your LDM one, and now you see um, you see the second version of it. And then you can see the prompt at the bottom. So very, very impressive models, and um, the reason why um, this can work quite well is because of the representation in which audio gets converted into. So when you have a, a string of audio, then you have some sort of signal. That signal gets converted into a digital format that we call audio. So sound goes and becomes audio, and then that digital format be can become uh, an image that we call a spectrogram. Once you have an image, you can treat audio in a similar way as you do actual images. That's where you, we can do some of these cool things with them. Um, a flow-based model, uh, a really cool example that I found, it was Graph AF. I don't know what the AF stands for. Uh, I thought were, you know, it could have been a quite nerdy way of describing graphs, but I'm just making fun of it. But it's, a, it's a really cool paper that talks about how to create molecular graph uh, generation with flow-based models. And then uh, for the last uh, piece, so why do they matter? Uh, why are these things important? Well, uh, realism, so machine learning generated data, especially through advanced models like GANs, they can closely mimic real data and capture like, very, very detailed patterns in pictures. In order that, they can make things that, yes, they don't exist for you, like, well, maybe this should exist. Uh, the other one, that's various applications, suitable for a wide range of applications, including image generation, text, Style transfer. Style transfer, I think, is quite cool. Um, if you think about retail um, and imagine that a person says, "Hey, I want to see myself inside this picture. Here's a picture of me in my whole body," and then you could put a T-shirt or a piece of clothing um, in a person, and then they tell you, "Well, I like it, but can it be red? Can it be blue?" And so, on. like, kind of transforming the experiences in which with which we purchase or which uh, experiences that oh, how we do things. Uh, and then another one is learning enhancement. So um, data generated by machine learning can enhance the performance of other models by providing additional training examples. But there's a caveat there, and I should have put like, a, a, like an asterisk at the end, because um, they can also make it worse. 
Okay, things to watch out for, uh, especially in fake data. Uh, fake data may lack the complexity and the nuances of the real world. When you take a randomly generated data, it's going to come from a distribution, and it's going to, and everything is going to look kind of the same, spaced out the same, and so on. Um, so it can be very unsuitable for, in particular, training machine learning models. So there's limited applicability there because, for what I said now, um, you couldn't train a machine learning model with fake data. You could, but it's probably not going to come out very well. Uh, synthetic data, um, there's complexity, generating high quality data. The better quality, the more quality you want in a data set, the more you have to think through how you're going to sample from the distribution that generated that data to create a one, one that mimics the actual one. Um, uh, validation difficulty, ensuring the synthetic data uh, accurately represents the original data is crucial. Um, and that's something that makes you stop, think, before, before you can deploy or before you can use it in some sort of way. And then things to watch out for, uh, the last one, resource intensive. Training these uh, machine learning generated models, uh, generated, these models that generate synthetic data, it can be very, very um, costly. And then lastly, there can also be ethical concerns. Um, as you can see, those people, they look like they could be real. Um, so say for example, you paste one of those images in an ID and now you kind of like go by and, and try to create a fake persona uh, in some way. So that could be quite problematic. Uh, here's also deep fakes, like don't forget about that. That's probably the worst one. Like um, there's a lot of examples online of deep fakes and how people are impersonating other people. In particular, um, a targeted community or a targeted persona demographic is women. Uh, uh, with, uh, there's been porn scandals, uh, people using deep fakes for uh, to undress people, and, and that's something that brings very uh, the ethical concerns uh, of this technology to the forefront, and they should be taken seriously. Uh, okay, so some scenarios uh, I mentioned earlier: healthcare. You, I think, one of the biggest applications of synthetic data is in the healthcare space. Right now, like I wouldn't want my information to be leaked and then be used in some sort of model without my consent. I would like it to be used if it's going to help for something, but maybe I wouldn't like it without my consent. And in a, uh, there are ways in which this is being done. One in particular is called federated learning. I believe there was a talk yesterday about it. I wasn't able to see it, and I don't know if they were talking about healthcare, but I know federated learning um, is being used for use cases where you cannot access the data because it has personally identifiable information. Well, healthcare, that's probably the main one or one of the biggest ones. Uh, in the automotive industry, I should have put a nice looking one there, but I just thought that was a nice picture. Um, so in the automotive industry, a lot of deaths all across the world, not just the US, are through driving. I believe my home country, the Dominican Republic, was named in the last 10 years one of the worst countries to drive at, which I kind of think about it in a positive way. You learn how to drive over there, and like, you're good to go. You can go anywhere, and you'll be safe. So um, that's one of the ways that I like to think about it, but if we could improve it uh, with some sort of synthetic data, with some better training, cameras are gonna become more ubiquitous in, in side cars. Not necessarily to make it autonomous, but to make it a little bit safer to drive. So is there any way in which we can use synthetic data to train models that could advise us, or maybe not advise us, but alert us in specific moments when something might happen? Uh, in banking as well, synthetic data to create uh, new experiences for banking. So the things that you can do in a highly regulated industry, they're quite limited. What if you could create um, data to create new experiences without having to go and tell the users, hey, I use your data to see if this experience will work and then or to train this particular model. Um, it didn't, but don't worry, we're gonna get rid of the data, we're gonna get rid of the model and all the things that we did with your data. And so there's a separation of concerns there. Uh, retail. I mentioned the example where what if I just put my body, my figure, and I said, I want a t-shirt of this kind. I want, a, I want some pants of this color. And then it could just put it on me uh, in an image and I'd be like, okay, that would be nice. Um, two of those. So that would be a cool, a cool application that could come up um, and it would be with synthetic data. And then, okay, so now uh, I have a little demo uh, for everyone. I mentioned I was going to use my uh, my missus um, and a couple of the tools, and let me see if we can see this better. Okay, so here we have here we have my missus. This one is a fake data generate uh, generator tool. Um, one of the coolest things is that it has different classes for what you need. So uh, there's a main class called generic 
that you can use to generate different personas, different addresses, different demographic information, but also uh, geographic information of sorts. And, uh, but you can also split it into different, into different things. So for example, here I have the persona, the data, the text, and the generic. Then you have the locale. The locale is the thing that allows you to describe where you want your distribution, your fake distribution to come from. Um, and also information, particular information about it. So for example, here we have the persona class, and you can see, um, let me scroll down, um, you have identifiers, tele so all demographic information that you would be interested in. Uh, phone number, um, language, uh, academic degree that you would want for a person, university that that person might, uh, might have gone to, nationality, uh, worldview, and so on. And then um, if you want to access uh, particular things, you can also split it in different ways. So I have the gender class and I can say I want a female, I want a male. I don't know if it has a different kind of, uh, if it accounts for different, for other genders. I do know that it's very uh, straightforward to create a new class and inject it into the application, which makes it really, really cool, because things that are not in this fake data generator, you could add them from the synthetic, uh, synthetic data world as well. Um, so here we have Joha, Johna, uh, Fox, um, and then you can also have a male, uh, Stephen Cortez. Here we have a different example where you can say, I want a person from Ukraine, and actually that's a little bit confusing, it's not UK, uh, the UK, Great Britain is UK, Ukraine, so here you have uh, the time, the local time over there, or the date time, a random date uh, over there. If you were to access the time, it would give you the time in that part of the world. Um, uh, then you can get a quote uh, from different places and so on. You can generate usernames, you can generate um, datetimes, you can generate uh, different names and from different variations. Um, you can also do it from Spanish, uh, Agosto, uh, Piña, Fruit, um, and then you can also have one last thing that I find really compelling. And it's if you get this thing called fill set, you can assign how many, how many samples do I want. I want 100, but I can put 1,000, I can put 10,000. 20,000 and so on. And then I can start creating things, different things, um, to be able to, um, so say for example, I have my little, um, I have my variable called fs, and I put here username, oops. Okay, there you go. So now we generated about 100 usernames for me. But if I say um, random dot rand int, I think I have to give it a, um, let me see if, uh, actually it works. if it has some defaults. It doesn't have some defaults, but you can also use a specific classes from it to generate, um, let's see, A equals one, B equals 100. Ah, there you go. Um, so you can generate uh, different um, uh, different variations of numbers that are randomly generated. One more minute. Okay, cool. And then we have on the other use case, we have the actual synthetic data. Um, and I have different demos here, but Say, for example, um, you have a fake hotel guest, and then you have your data frame here. You're going to have credit card numbers, which you definitely don't want that to be leaked. That will be considered personally identifiable information, uh, billing address, and, and the email of a person. Um, you're going to get a piece of information for that data set that you're going to call um, the metadata. Then you're going to get, um, you're going to assign, you're going to create Pick a method that you want to use to generate synthetic data from that data set. Here they have a class called FastML, and that applies the, um, the baseline model to generate synthetic data from. And then, so I pass in my real data, and then I give it a number of samples. This is not the same as in Panda, where you say sample, give me random samples from a data set. This is saying, I want to generate a specific amount of samples. So now I have, from this one, I have different, um, I have a synthetic data. But notice what it does for you. It maps the personal identifiable information to specific variables that it understands has this kind of information, and then it masks it. So here we have example.org, but if we come right up here, we have brown.this, uh, neil.com, and so on. Um, and then also for the credit card, it also maps it to a different one, so it doesn't generate actual credit card numbers from it. Um, you can also um, check by specifically grabbing some of them and then checking that it did it. Um, generate anything that could have been in the real data set. And then you can generate uh, little reports that tell you, that compare the quality of the synthetic data generated versus the quality of the real. So how similar is my synthetically uh, generated data to the real one? 
and that's something that you really care about because the closer it is to reality, uh, the better. You can also compare um, different, uh, the real one in, in different ways. You can compare the real one with the, uh, uh, with the fake one. And then lastly, uh, well actually, um, I, did, I, did, okay, I, I did have an example on uh, machine learning generated data, but I think everybody here is quite um, uh, probably uh, used to interacting with some of these tools. Um, and uh, the one example that I have here is like you can put a phrase in a particular language and you can use a, um, a machine learning model to generate, uh, to translate it or to generate different takes based on your input. And um, with that, um, let me put the one last time. I want to say thank you, everyone, for coming. The key takeaway that I have is that you can do a lot with synthetic data, but don't do it all. Uh, well, thank you very much, everyone.